why then I do but to dream on sovereignty. Like one that stands upon a promontory and spies a far off shore where he would tread, wishing his foot were equal with his eye. <laughs> and chides the sea that sanders him from thence, saying he'll heel laid it dry to have his way. So do I wish the crown being so far off. And so I chide the means that keeps me from it. And so I say that I'll cut the causes off. I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown. And whilst I live to count this world but hell until my misshapen trunk, which bears this head, be round impaled with a glorious crown. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. Within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh that walls about our lives were brass impregnable. And then humoured thus, comes at the last, and with a little pin bores through his castle walls, and farewell, king. Cover your heads, and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence, throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty, for you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me I am a king? The torrents roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god, and Cassius is a wretched creature who must bend her body if Caesar carelessly but nod on her. He had a fever when he was in Spain, and when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. It is true, that God did shake, and that same eye whose bend doth all the world did lose his luster. I did hear him groan, <laughs> aye, and that tongue of his that bade the Romans mark him and write his speeches in their books, alas, it cried, give me some drink, Tintinius as a sick girl. Ye gods, it doth amaze me how a man of such a feeble temper should so get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. I dreamt there was an emperor, Antony. Oh, such another sleep that I might see but such another man. His face was as the heavens, and therein stuck a sun and moon which kept their course and lighted the little o the earth. His legs bestrid the ocean, his reared arm crested the world, his voice was propertied as all the tuned spheres and that to friends, but when he meant to quail and shake the orb he was as rattling thunder. His bounty there was no winter in it, an autumn it was, which grew the more by reaping. 
in his livery walked crowns and crownets, realms and islands were as plates dropped from his pockets. Think you there was, or might be, such a man as this I dreamed. This is the air, that is the glorious sun. This pearl she gave me, I do feel it and see it, and though tis wonder that enwraps me thus, yet tis not madness. Where's Antonio then? I could not find him at the elephant, yet there he was, and there I found this credit that he did range the town to seek me out. <laughs> his counsel now might do me golden service, for though my soul disputes well within my sense that this may be some error, but no madness, yet doth this accident and flood of fortune so far exceed all instance, all discourse, that I am ready to distrust mine eyes and wrangle with my reason that persuades me to any other trust, but that I am mad, or else the lady's mad. But if twas so, she could not sway her house, command her followers, take and give back affairs and their dispatch with such a smooth, discreet and stable bearing as I perceive she does. There's something in it that is deceivable. But here the lady comes. I that did die and go we know not where, did lie in cold obstruction and to rot. This sensible warm notion to become a kneaded clod, the delighted spirit to bathe in the fiery floods or to reside in toiling region of thick ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in viewless winds, and blown with a restless violence round about the pendant world, to be worse than worst of those that, lawless and uncertain thought, imagine howling. It is too horrible. The weariest and most loathed worldly life that age, ache, penury, or imprisonment can lay on nature as a paradise. To what we fear of death. Come you, my lord, to see my open shame. Now thou dost penance too, look how they gaze. See how the giddy multitude do point and nod their heads and throw their eyes on thee. Ah, Gloucester, hide thee from their hateful looks, and in thy closet pent up rue my shame and ban thine enemies, both mine and thine. Ah, Gloucester, teach me to forget myself. For whilst I think I am thy married wife, and thou a prince, protector of this land, methinks I should not thus be led along, mailed up in shame with papers on my back, and followed with a rabble that rejoice to see my tears and hear my deep fet groans. The ruthless flint doth cut my tender feet. And when I start, the envious people laugh and bid me be advised how I tread. Ah, Humphrey, can I bear this shameful yoke? Trowest thou that e'er I'll look upon the world, or count them happy that enjoys the sun? No, dark shall be my light, and night my day, to think upon my pomp shall be my hell. Is dear mercy, and thou seest it not. Tis torture, and not mercy. Heaven is here, where Juliet lives, and every cat, and dog, and little mouse, every unworthy thing, live here in heaven, and may look on her, but Romeo may not. More validity, more honourable state, more courtship lives in Karen flies than Romeo. They may seize on the white wonder of Juliet's hand and steal immortal blessings from her lips, who, even in pure and vestal modesty, still blush as thinking their own kisses sin, but Romeo may not. She, 
is banished. Flies may do this when I from this must fly. They are free men, and I am banished. And sayest thou yet that exile is not death? Hast thou no poison mixed? No sharp ground knife, no sudden mean of death, though nay is so mean but banished to kill me. Banished. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? And wakes it now? to look so green and pale at what it did so freely. Huh. Ah, from this time such I account thy love. Art thou feared to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? What, wouldst thou have that which thou esteems thee, the ornament of life? and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage. Well, of what beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. So I desire you do me right and justice, for I'm a most poor woman and a stranger, born out of your dominions. Alas, well, sir, in what cause have I offended? What crime hath my behavior to your displeasure caused that you should thus proceed to put me off <laughs> and take me from your good graces? Heaven witness, I have been a true and humble wife, at all times to your will conformable, ever in fear to kindle your dislike, as I saw it inclined. When have I not saw your desire and made it mine too? What friend of yours have I not strove to love, though I knew he were mine enemy? What friend of mine have I not put off when he derived your anger? Nay, gave notice he was from thence discharged. Wherefore, I beseech you, sir, to spare me. It must be by his death. And for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him. But for the general, he would be crowned. How that might change his nature. There's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the other, and that craves weary walking, crown him that, and I swear we put a sting in him, that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affections swayed more than his reason. But tis common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, where to the climber upward turns his face, and when he once attains the utmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which it did ascend. So Caesar may. Then, lest he may, prevent. I know you all, and will a while uphold the unyoked humour of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother over his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapours that did seem strangle him. If all the year were playing holidays, 
to sport would be as tedious as to work, yet when they seldom come, they wish for come, and nothing pleaseth but rare accidents. So when this loose behaviour I throw off, and pay the debt I never priced, by how much more than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify men's hopes. Like bright metal on the sullen ground, my reformation glistening o'er my faults, shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I will offend as to make offence a skill, redeeming time when men think I least will. Thou art not holy to belie me so. I am not mad. This hair I tear is mine. My name is Constance, I was Geoffrey's wife, young Arthur is my son, and he is lost. I am not mad. I would to heaven I were, for then tis like I should forget myself. Oh, if I could, what grief would I forget? Preach some philosophy to make me mad, and thou shalt be canonised cardinal. For being not mad, but sensible of grief, my reasonable part produces reason how I may be delivered of these woes, and teaches me to kill or hang myself. If I were mad, I should forget my son, or madly think a babe of clouts were he. I am not mad, too well, too well, I feel the different plague of each calamity. To whom should I complain? Did I tell this? Who would believe me? O oh, Perilous mouths, that bear in them one and the selfsame tongue, either of condemnation or a proof, bidding the law make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite, to follow as it draws. I'll do my brother. Though he hath fallen by prompture of the blood, yet hath he in him such a mind of honour, that had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, he'll yield them up, before his sister should her body stoop to such a bored pollution. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, else would a maiden blush be paint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak tonight. Fain would I dwell on form, fain, fain deny what I have spoke. But farewell compliment, dost thou love me? I know thou wilt say I, and I will take thy word. Yet if thou swearest, thou mayst prove false. A lover's perjury, they say Jove laughs. O oh, gentle Romeo, if thou dost love, pronounce it faithfully. Or if thou think'st I'm too quickly won, I'll frown and be perverse and say thee nay, so thou wilt woo but else not for the world. In truth, fair Montague, I am too fond, and therefore thou mayst think my haviour light, but trust me, gentlemen, I'll prove more true than those that have more cunning to be strange. I should have been more strange, I must confess, but that thou beheardst, ere I will swear my true love's passion. Therefore pardon me, and do not impute this yielding to light love, which the dark night has so discovered. Let me say, uh, I cannot speak him home. He stopped the flyers, and by his rare example made the coward time terror into sport. As weeds before a vessel under sail, so men obeyed and fell below his stem. His sword, death's stamp, where it did mark it, took from face to foot. He was a thing of blood, whose every motion was timed with dying cries. Alone he entered the mortal gate of the city which he painted with shunless destiny. Aedlus came off and with a sudden reinforcement struck Corylee like a planet. Now all was his. 
and by and by the din of war can pierce his ruddy strength, but straight his double spirit requickened what in flesh was fatigate, and to the battle came he, where he did run, reeking o'er the lives of men as if twere perpetual spoil. Until we called both field and city ours, he never stood to ease his breast with panting.